Let's study the femur, one of the bones of the lower limb. The femur is the longest bone in the body and found in the thigh. Many, many other structures in the thigh of the lower limb are named for it. They use the word femoral is used quite a bit. To begin your study of the femur, you should stay, step back and take a look at the whole bone for a moment. You want to be able to recognize what the anterior and posterior side of the bone looks like. There are a number of features on the bone that will help you to understand or to um, to know which side you're looking at. Let me point out a few of those for you. Um, there is a ridge of bone on the posterior side that is quite prominent. Runs in sort of a diagonal um, direction as you see here. There is something similar to that on the anterior side of the bone, but it's much lower. Also, there is a prominent projection on the posterior side of the bone that is directed to the posterior. Uh, in the anterior view, you can see it just peeking out from behind. Also, when you look at the shaft of the bone, you can see that the posterior side is quite rough, where the anterior side is very, very smooth. There's a rough line running down the back side. And then at the distal end of the bone, you can see that the cavities that are there are very shallow in the front and quite deep in the back. The whitened areas there are the articular cartilage that covers the ends of the bone where they meet in a joint. So, this is the whole femur, and you want to have a few of these landmarks so that if you're looking at a picture or if you're handling the bone and you want to identify some of its elements that you know whether you're looking at the front or the back of the bone. Now in our study of the femur, these are the different features that I'm asking those in my class to learn. And I've divided them into four groups based on their general location. Uh, a group of bones near the very proximal end, uh, a group of features just below that, then some features along the shaft, and finally some features at the distal end. Let's take each group one at a time. The proximal end of the bone is fairly easy. The head and the neck are usually pretty obvious to people. The rounded ball-like portion that fits into the socket of the coxal bone is pretty obvious and where it narrows that's pretty obviously a neck. The term that might be new for many students is fovea. A fovea is a hole but not a hole that runs all the way through the bone, one that is dug like you would dig a hole with a shovel, what some people would call a pit. So the word fovea is probably best translated as a pit. And of course the word capitus, like many other cap or caput words, is referring to the head. So fovea capitus, literally the pit in the head. And we've located the head. So we're looking for a little cutout which will be pretty much right in the center of the head there. If you move just below the neck or inferior to that, you come to four objects that have a similar term within them. The first that we want to identify is called the greater trochanter. It's 180 degrees from the head. It's quite large and prominent. You can palpate it at the side of your hip. You can feel it move if you put your hand just below the ridge of your hip and move your thigh bone around, you will feel the greater trochanter there and feel it moving. 
The other trochanter is the lesser trochanter. This is that feature that we pointed out is quite prominent on the posterior side of the bone. And so there's two trochanters, a larger one that is more superficial and a lesser one that is posterior and a little more deep. Now along with that, there are two features that run between these. Uh, on the anterior side of the bone is an intertrochanteric line. A line feature is shallow, but it can be noticed, it can be felt. The term intertrochanteric is obviously a reference to it running between the two trochanters. On the posterior side is a much larger a heavier sort of feature, and this is a crest, the intertrochanteric crest. So the anterior and the posterior side of the bone can be determined from these four features right here, as well as many other things. But these four make a nice learning bite, um, two trochanters, and two intertochanteric structures. When we move to the shaft, there are a number of features we could include, but here I'm just asking you to learn two. The roughened line down the back of the bone that you see here, I've just colored it blue, is known as the linea aspera. The linea aspera. And superior to that, is a roughened area that's a little bit wider, kind of a, a widening of the linea aspera as you move proximally on the bone. And this is referred to as the gluteal tuberosity. The gluteal tuberosity would, of course, be an attachment site for the gluteus maximus muscle. So just two features on the shaft. Finally, at the distal end of the bone, the most prominent structure here are the two condyles. A condyle is a rounded knob-like structure that's a part of a joint that fits into features on another bone. So this femur has two condyles. It'll be important for you to be able to tell the lateral condyle from the medial condyle. It's not real possible here in these pictures where I've tried to enlarge them enough. Um, you'll want to refer back to the superior end or the proximal end of the bone to see which way the head of the bone is facing. The head is always pointing medially into the joint structure. And so whichever condyle is on the side where the head is is going to be the medial one. The lateral condyle is going to be directly below the greater trochanter. So you want to identify the two condyles. Associated with these two condyles are the epicondyles. And these are the lumps that stick laterally and medial from the sides of the two condyles. Let me remove those condyle images so you can see them more clearly here. If you were to take your fingers and pinch your knee at its widest point, point, these two lumps of the femur are what you would be feeling, two epicondyles. And again, there's a medial one and a lateral one. And you'll determine those just like you did the condyles. Um, finally, here at the distal end, um, more central to the bone, um, is a joint surface in the front, which is referred to as the patellar groove. And of course, this makes reference to the fact that the patella slides or glides within this area. And this is definitely on the anterior side. On the posterior side, there's a deep sort of cavity or recess between the two condyles that is referred to as the intercondylar fossa. In other words, between the condyles and the fossa being a depression. It's much deeper, so it's very easy to tell the anterior from the posterior side of the bone at this distal end. 
So that's the femur. Just one more time, the whole picture. Remember, visualizing the anterior and the posterior side, you're going to use things like the lesser trochanter, which is more prominent on the posterior side, the intertrochanteric crest and the intertrochanteric line, the crest being much more prominent, the roughened edge of the linea aspera, showing you the posterior side, and at the distal end, then, the difference between the patellar groove and the intercondylar fossa. On the whole, the posterior side of the bone has much more, uh, is much more feature-rich and, and has got a lot more uh, structures to make note of. Anterior side is, is a much smoother surface. Okay, hope that helps. And... Uh, Look at some of the other bone lectures if you need to.